Hi, this is your Supil Bharatiya and welcome to TF Let's Talk. Today we have with us Neil Jagdish Patel, CEO and co-founder of Exam. Neil, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, cheers. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's my pleasure to host you here. Uh, tell us the story and history of the company. What led you to co-found Exam? We kind of, I think sometimes accidentally, in a way, ended up doing what we do today. But um, we, we co-founded it just because we we were around and just felt the problems around event data, essentially, just the growing amount of data. Event data is essentially data like timestamp JSON. You know, something's happened, you want to send it somewhere because you may have an immediate use for it or you may want to use it afterwards. And the kind of services we were building before Axiom, we were always reliant on other kind of vendors to fill that gap for us. And we had just found issues around uh, just scale, cost, those kinds of things. And so, you know, when we decided to do something for ourselves, it felt like this was something which was a pain point and worth working on. And can you also talk about what is Axiom? Look, the problem that we're trying to solve is kind of, in a way, just underneath what other vendors would do in this space. So if you're thinking about observability vendors, if you're thinking about security or anything really that requires that kind of event to power the functionality, what we've done is kind of gone into more of an infrastructure layer and built an app, built out a platform that allows you to almost detach the sources of the data that you have within the company, where that data immediately goes and gets stored and is made queryable, operational, etc., and then these services you use on the other side. And so what Axiom does is fill this gap that's just been like a big hole that's just been sitting in all of these different enterprises and companies where, you know, you've been basically sending this data to third-party vendors they almost lease it back out to you and then you pay for the retention that you pay for and things like that. And Axiom just lets you silo bust, allows you to do vendor management, like cost control, downstream uh, retention control, consolidation, those kinds of things. But it also just comes with this really flexible user interface that allows you to kind of explore the data immediately upon kind of getting it ingested and also just store it for as long as you want, really. If you look at observability, if you look at practices, tools, it seems like there are overlaps with other, you know, personas or other, you know, practices. You can go into increasing performance. You can use observability for cost efficiency. You can use observability for security also. Not can use, but uh, so when you look at the tools, you'll see, you know, those kind of overlaps. And then, of course, you'll see gaps also. So how do you look at observability? I think it's really much the it's like the starting of all of this right because the the fact is is you need to know what's happening inside of your systems that's different kind of layers of that it could be your application or services you use it could be the cloud that you use it could be the auth authentication kind of network the firewalls those kinds of things really when that data to us is something that you can derive so much more from than just a dashboard, right? And just a dashboard for one single team. So when you think about how that works inside of companies, for us, having a centralized source of that data, which isn't for archival use cases or analytical use cases, but actually pulls operational use case, which is the immediate, the now, together with the analytical and the archival in one system, that's what we've been building for and building out the platform for because it feels like that has to be kind of like the basis of what security teams would need, what observability teams would need, and kind of wider how people would learn about how the product is working, etc. as well. Really, that timestamp JSON just carries so much weight, but you kind of need it in one place to make sense of it. And can you also talk about when we look at, of course, Observability or security and security. How many companies are actually looking at building a single data platform versus uh, the kind of struggle they face with their current environment? How painful it is, and what are Exam doing to kind of uh, help them? Yeah, and so this was the thing for us where you know initially this just made sense for us to build, and then as we talk to more companies and larger companies, larger enterprises, financial institutions, et cetera, what we found was they've been trying to plug this gap really for over a decade. 
And what it's happened is they've never quite got to where they wanted to be. It's a huge time sink and cost sink as well. And then in the same way, they almost feel like they're at their wits end with essentially controlling the amount of data that's generated. You know, they're growing 20%, 40% month on month, right? (laughs) Which is like just crazy to even try and plan, plan for when you're already into the petabyte scale. And then on the flip side, um, their vendors haven't really shifted to accommodate the emerging needs of like multiple, um, you know, like multiple teams inside of a company, the organization growing, the fact that you have jurisdiction or issues in different places and things like that. And so what we've seen is kind of companies that have tried to pull this together using a bunch of open source tech um, and done a you know, a good job for what they were doing. We've seen that other companies have kind of gone down three or four different routes and given up. And that's kind of where we go in and say, well, unlike a standalone SIM or a standalone, uh, let's say, you know, uh, observability vendor, something like that, here's kind of what we think is that, again, that missing piece and where we feel, where we're spending our time, you know, and our resource. Can you also talk about what kind of data we're talking about? Because data could mean different things. We are collecting a lot of data. We are generating a lot of data. Uh, and also we use data lake, data houses, data lake houses. Data itself has no value. You have to extract the value from the data. So talk a bit about what kind of data are we talking about here? Yeah, absolutely. So um, event data is what Axiom deals in. Event data, we think, is probably the most important data your company produces. The reason for that is it's the byproduct of every action that happens inside of your organization. And so if someone is adding something to a cart in your web app, if you if someone's failing to log in, if your own employees have, you know, if someone's misusing a entrance card to firewalls being hit with a DDoS to um, how is your new service uh, working in production, etc. All of those, uh, that data is events. It's timestamp JSON that needs to land somewhere which can essentially almost blindly absorb the entire fire hose that's being generated from thousands of sources, have it immediately put into a very, very cheap storage um, environment, and then essentially be queryable instantly. Those kind of three things of being able to ingest a lot of it, store it for as long as you want immediately, and then query it as well well, whenever you want and immediately. What that does is essentially... um, it kind of wraps around the use cases of that kind of data, so that event data. And then actually, that's also the seed for what you would send to Snowflake, Databricks, and things like that. Maybe you've rolled it up or reduced it, aggregated it, those kinds of things before it goes there. Also, when we look at event data, how long organizations like to keep the data? What is the shelf life of the data? And how do you enable them to store the data for whatever period of time they need it. It's interesting because it does really vary from company to company and actually have different stakeholders in that decision. So, you know, probably the most important stakeholder is a compliance stakeholder or a security stakeholder, which would say at least this much, many months, usually this many years. Um, And that's kind of like one to three years for normal companies. Um, Then you also have potentially product stakeholders, you can have financial, et cetera, where they come in and say, well, actually, if it's already in this form and it's queryable whenever we want, can we actually backfill everything? And now I don't want a retention on it because it's so cheap to store um, that. And the fact that you don't have to do any gymnastics to query it, even if it's like, you know, four, five, seven years ago, you can just instantly query it whenever you want. Like that allows them to start thinking about, oh, maybe I can use this for forecasting. Maybe I can use this to learn from what happened. And so they have their own needs. And then so it ends up as a discussion between those two things. In the world of Axiom, you know, three years, 10 years, whatever, you're not super, you know, we don't really care. The way we've built out our search infrastructure, it's 
completely serverless. It uses all the resources that we can to go answer the question you want. And so essentially makes it super easy to make sense of that data. But yeah, we are working with one company that needs 14 years. So it <laughs> goes to show that there's some really interesting use cases hiding. And if you look at, you know, HGM, and who would you consider your competitors? Of course, a lot of things have changed in the last 10 years, especially with that. I will know Kubernetes. We talk a lot about cloud native. Cloud native is not a thing. It's a kind of process. Who would you consider your competitors, whether a big player or new player? And what edge do you have over them? And also, should I consider you as an incumbent or should I consider you as a newcomer and you are beating incumbents? I think we're a newcomer growing up, so <laughs> we're not an incumbent yet. But I think it's hard to define us as like what we would be an incumbent in. So the reason for that is like, there hasn't really been a technology out there that gels these three layers together. So the layers of Axiom are a brand new data store that we built from scratch for this data. And so, as I mentioned, like super efficient ingest, very, very long-term retention out of the um, gate and immediately queryable whenever you want without having to worry about bringing up, you know, triple XL warehouses or S or whatever you're doing. Then there's a pipelining layer, which we call Axiom Flow, which means that Axiom isn't a silo. So it's not another data store where you throw data in and the only way of getting that data is to query that data store. Instead, we've really thought about how Axiom exists in the ecosystem within your org. And so that what that allows you to do is connect Axiom to downstream vendors and do experimentation, cost control, vendor management, and things like that. And then on top of it, uh, there's a third layer, which is the UI and the app experience, which is really familiar to people who use Splunk or LogScale and tools like that. And so we have a pipelined query language, hyper familiar to anyone who's used SPL before or KQL, et cetera. You can do aggregations and filtering and all the things, dashboarding, alerting, et cetera. So it's a little bit strange because when you put the pack, the, all three of those layers together, there's nothing else like it. When you combine them into the ways you want, yes, there are competitors. You could just see as Axiom as a competitor for Honeycomb, for tracing, right? For distributed tracing. Or you could see it just for competing with Elastic or Humio at, you know, a 40th of the cost or whatever it is. So it kind of depends on what your immediate need is. But then the, you know, the overall thing is we hope that we fit into a bigger picture and it's not just about rip and replace everywhere. Of course, we talk a lot about costs and complexity. How do you kind of keep yourself not as expensive as Datadog Splunk, or you give another examples, few examples also. So uh, talk about the cost aspect, the benefits that uh, customers will get by going with you folks. We are obsessive about it down to the last bite. We, um, everything cost basis is really built. It comes from the data store. And so if you're using off the shelf parts and trying to put something like this together, you will find and uh, create inefficiencies in that, which then, you know, maybe not so bad for 10 terabytes a day, you know, a few hundred terabytes a day. But when you really start getting into the large uh, amounts of data, those kind of inefficiencies build up into something that is just makes something makes it prohibitive essentially for a company to get to the value that they're getting to. And so the way we stay ahead of everyone is that we've taken that responsibility on ourselves. And it's kind of why Axiom's an old new company <laughs> because it takes a bit of time to go and build something new from scratch, new architecture, new way of working. But that's how we kind of make sure that we're doing everything I say at a level of efficiency, which ideally means the company that we, you know, the orgs that we're working with do not have to worry about a terabyte extra here or 10 terabytes extra there. They're not like license focused. They can actually just do what they need to do to like build the best products themselves. What are some of the emerging workloads? Uh, of course, I'm talking about Jenny I. Uh, how, how, how do you look at those workloads? And let's look at from two lenses. One is to look at them as workloads. Second is to leverage them to further improve your own capabilities. 
Yeah, I mean, workloads wise, it's interesting because it emerged, the use cases of those emerged inside of Axiom itself. Because, for instance, you know, we were building, are building, um, like, fine tunes across so many different things, whether it's to do with our query language, whether it's to do with kind of uh, suggestions around that, helping you complete those kinds of things. Uh, same things in terms of like naming, dashboards, this, that, whatever. And so we initially, like everybody else, started to write a bunch of Python code, uh, you know, grab all this data from Axiom to then kind of shape it and do all the things you would already do inside of Axiom and then essentially uh, go send it somewhere. And so what kind of happened was we realized that this should all be, you know, at least that kind of the cleaning up of the data, processing it, um, filtering it, those kinds of things, more and more we wanted that inside of it. And so what we found even with customers is with Flow, what they're doing is they're kind of sending the kitchen sink, like throwing it at Axiom, and then kind of building out data sets which are much, much more cleaner, and then just kind of sending them over in Parquet or whatever they need into S3 for the next stage of their kind of building. So yeah, that kind of happened. But um you know, generally, yeah, it's if you see the kind of the time saving that's possible in so much of the work that is done inside of a product like ours, um, even if you think about something as simple as pipelines, actually being able to suggest or recommend uh, through knowledge of the errors that have happened or the warnings that have occurred, just small fixes to make things more robust make things more trustable, to check that the right kind of stuff is happening, etc. You know, some of that can just be done in code. Some of that, when you think about uh, the names of fields and things like that, that ability to kind of get a little bit more reason out of it and being able to kind of extrapolate that even the weirdest field names, what they could be and what the intent of was for the user. I think that's just a super exciting thing and uh, it's something which I can't wait for the world to see more about with what we've been building. Neil, thank you so much for joining yeah. me today and after talk about the company. Uh, thank you for great insights and I look forward to chatting with you folks again. Thank you. Cool. Thank you for having me.